Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guests are Andrew Johnson and Kenny Baker. Have you ever asked yourself, what do you do to prevent diseases and unnecessary crisis in your life? Or what do you do if you do get a disease or find yourself in a crisis? And what can you do to maximize your chances of returning to a vital life and minimize your chances of a disease or crisis returning? These are the questions Paul posed to Andrew and Kenny, two amazing athletes who recently completed the Race Across America, the RAM, to raise money for pediatric cancer research. The RAM is one of the most grueling cycling events in the world. The race started in Oceanside, California and ended up in Annapolis, Maryland, 3,070 miles through harsh winds and extreme heat of up to 128 degrees Fahrenheit. Many races dropped out of the 2021 event, and the did-not-finish rate was one of the highest seen in any RAM event. But Andrew and Kenny's team, composed of many cancer survivors, did complete the race. In 2006, Andrew, a master check practitioner, became the first leukemia survivor to qualify for and finish the Hawaiian Ironman World Championships. Since then, he has completed multiple Ironman races as well as the RAM. Kenny, a level two Czech practitioner, joined the 2021 team because his wife and other family members have suffered from cancer, and he felt it is important to help create awareness around holistic, long-term healing options. In this episode, you'll hear Andrew and Kenny talk about the most challenging times of their lives and how those challenges have shaped them not only as individuals, but given them the strength and endurance to handle a race of the grueling intensity of the RAM. They discuss how their training through the Czech Institute has helped them heal, stay healthy, and compete in elite-level athletics. Andrew and Kenny share their most memorable experiences from the RAM, and together with Paul, they explore the qualities an athlete needs to develop to handle such challenging athletic events. The three talk about the skills, abilities, and qualities that anyone can develop through conscious awareness and that can help a person get through a disease crisis, and why it is that some very healthy people do get serious diseases. Paul finishes this episode discussing the importance of finding a balanced perspective on the use of both allopathic and holistic approaches to healing, including the benefits and limitations to both approaches, and why we need to remain conscious of what tools we have in our toolbox. Today's episode is an inside look at the lives of truly elite athletes who have dealt with serious, life-threatening challenges in their own lives, and who have walked the tightrope between life and death many times. Enjoy and learn from this down-to-earth, honest exploration of the challenges of both diseases and the toughest athletic events human beings can engage in. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our title is The Race for Your Life. And I have two very amazing athletes, very interesting people, and skilled Czech professionals to share with you. And that is Andrew Johnston and Kenny Baker. Now, these guys just recently completed the race across America that started in Oceanside, California and ended in Annapolis, Maryland, 3,070 miles of bike riding through harsh winds and extreme heat of 128 degrees. Many racers dropped out and did not finish the race, and the rate of dropout was higher than most RAM events, which is race across America. But interestingly, cancer survivors and on Andrews and Kenny's team, did complete the race. So I think that's something to talk about. Andrew Johnston is a master Czech practitioner, which means he completed all Czech training and wrote his thesis and got passed. And it was an awesome thesis. I graded it myself. Kenny Baker is a Czech practitioner level two, HLC one and golf biomechanic and joined the team with the other cancer survivors to raise money, uh, raise money for pediatric cancer research. The Race Across America is recognized as one of, if not the most challenging of bicycle races in the world, right there with Tour de France. So welcome, guys, and thanks for sharing with all of us about this very interesting and profound experience you guys had in the Race Across America. Appreciate you having us, Paul. Thanks for having us, man. Yeah, thanks for having us. My pleasure. You know, it's it's fun for me. Uh, you know, I started, as you know, the Institute in 1995, and it's been just an absolutely mind-blowing journey to meet so many Czech professionals that are elite athletes or who have 
really accomplished a, a tremendous amount in their professional careers from making it on to professional sports teams or high ranking uh, positions in medical facilities to uh, starting their own healing resorts and retreats to their own food lines and all sorts of stuff. So it's just a real great pleasure. Andrew, you've been on the podcast before, and and so some people may recognize you. And Andrew, you've written a couple of books as well. Do you want to share the names of your books just right up front before we forget to mention that? Yeah, sure. My my first one uh, is Holistic Strength Training for Triathlon. And uh, just to let you know, I actually started putting pen to paper when I was tied to an IV pole and, you know, couldn't train. So I figured I might as well make, make hay while the sun shines and, and do some riding. And then my second one uh, is Spot on Nutrition. And obviously it's a nutrition based uh, book. And you wrote the forward. And I dare say that if anybody wants to read it, the forward alone is, is, is worth the price of admission. So uh, go, go <laughs> grab that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've, you know, uh, believe it or not, I think there's probably been somewhere between 40 and 50 books published by Czech professionals now, and I've probably written wow. forwards in about 15 of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can think of nobody better. You know, if you've got that background in the Czech principles, uh, who else would you want to write for it other than Paul Czech himself? <laughs> Kenny, you haven't written any books, have you? No, I guess I've got to get to work, Paul. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't rush because writing a book, as Andrew can tell you, is a lot of work. And I'm in the middle of a big one right now. And boy, I'll tell you, it's a day and night process. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear from each of you about your development and particularly the most challenging times of your life and how they have shaped you, not only as a person, but given you the strength and endurance to handle a race of the grueling intensity of the race across America. I mean, I don't know. How many people listening have ever watched or heard of the race across America? But to ride 3,070 miles on a bicycle nonstop, and you guys are basically operating on almost no sleep, aren't you? How are you, how are you doing that? It's, it's on rotation. So how do you survive that? Yeah, we, we had uh, two squads. It was supposed to be an eight-man team, but we lost – one guy from England coming over due to COVID restrictions. So we were seven guys. And at the last minute, um, Kenny and I and a guy named Matt, who's another pretty solid cyclist, were on the same team. So we had a three-man squad and then a four-man squad. And we were doing eight-hour shifts. So your circadian rhythms were just destroyed from the get-go. I mean, um, you know, you were trying to sleep in the middle of the day, right after coming off a hard shift. And it, it just wasn't happening. I don't know about Kenny, but I literally, I got no more than 10 hours of sleep in that six days across the country for sure. Yeah. Kenny, how did you handle that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I, I predicted before the race started that on about day two to three, that we were going to just hit the wall, so to speak. And it was pretty accurate. I, by that time, I would talk to my wife on the phone when possible. And, and she was like, you, you're delirious. You're making no sense whatsoever. So, uh, yeah, I, I may have fared a bit better than Andrew, um, but I'm not uh, maybe two hours. So we'll say about 12 hours or so, you know, give or take. You know, that's also extremely dangerous. I mean, sleep deprivation uh, is the cause of a tremendous amount of injuries in the workplace. and when you're doing, um, you know, when you're, when you guys are writing in formation like that, it, it would be just so easy to touch wheels and find yourself spread all over the pavement. Plus you're dealing with heavy crosswinds and all sorts of like moving variables. So getting through a race that long with that little sleep has got to be, you know, it reminds me of, when guys go into ranger school in the military, they only have to give them one hour of sleep a night. And it's a, I think it's a four week or a six week school and they only have to feed them one meal a day. And most guys lose about 25 pounds, but many of the guys I knew that went in it described interesting things like seeing their friends talking to a tree, thinking it was their mother or trying to get a Coke out of it, thinking it was a Coke machine. <laughs> because <laughs> they were so sleep deprived 
yet they're having to do, you know, very rigorous military drills with targets and and high high speed shooting operations. So it certainly is a way to separate the weak from the strong. And and uh, you know, that's one thing. But seven days straight on a bicycle, and as I said to you guys, it's a wonder that you guys have any dicks left because the pain of <laughs> sitting on a bicycle seat for seven days straight or however many days it was just must have been gnarly in itself yeah it's uh as i said to you before paul it's the antithesis of everything you teach at the czech institute if uh you want to know what uh not to do as far as to get healthy go do ram i mean it'll 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 make you sick as a dog unless you're ready for it and that's that's why the czech training was so important leading up to it but as far as the sleep deprivation and touching wheels, the idea behind Ram is like with a seven man team, you have one guy out on the road. So we're doing a relay. We're not uh, drafting. Uh, we can, uh, as far as the team's concerned, but you can't draft other riders. And in general, if you had two people out there, that meant somebody wasn't resting, somebody wasn't sleeping, somebody wasn't eating, recovering for the next shift. So we were doing um, short shifts of anywhere between. Um, five minutes sometimes depending on what the terrain was up to about an hour or so and we just kept leapfrogging over each other tagging one man in and tagging one man out so the idea of touching wheels wasn't an issue that being said you got wild dogs you've got uh incredible you know tight turns you've got shitty roads uh dark nights so uh if you don't have uh, the car directly behind you you couldn't see what you're going into and that happens multiple times during the course of the race you're taking a left-hand turn and all of a sudden you're going into pitch black so uh i mean sleep deprivation was one of the challenges but it was only one of many yeah when i used to do triathlons and was doing a lot of triathlon training i was stationed at fayetteville north carolina where the 82nd airborne division is and i would ride all the way to myrtle beach which i think was 110 True. miles or something like that and then I would do a two mile swim and a buddy of mine would pick me up and drive me home. And I would just lay in the back of uh, his, it was actually, he would drive my, my uh, suburban and I would just be completely exhausted. But the thing that I remember from particularly that stretch of road, there was so many dogs that would just jump right out at you out of the ditches and come flying over fences and it was freaking scary. I'd have to beat these damn dogs off with my water pump or my bicycle pump or squirt water in their face, which you hated doing because then you end up with not enough water and you're out in the middle of you know nowhere. So I can't even imagine what that'd be like on an hour or two of sleep after five days. It would be like you'd, you'd kind of just get to the point where you'd say, fuck it, I think I'm going to get eaten today. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the cool thing about it, sometimes you weren't sure if that was a real dog or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. After a while. Yes. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little from each of you. You know, what are some of the forces and factors in your life that developed you to the point of being able to do this? And I, I think, too, Andrew, in your case, I, I think you should share your history with leukemia and, and what you work through for those that didn't listen to the last podcast, because I can't overstate i mean this is like one of the most grueling athletic events on the planet so uh i'd just like you to share with people how it is that you develop the physical emotional and mental toughness to be able to do that yeah i mean i think honestly my whole life set me up for it meaning um you know anything from being uh, a child of divorced parents since before I was two to being a, a latch key kid coming home, uh, fending for myself being, I mean, as, as a grown man, if you will, I'm only five foot four. So you can imagine what I was in elementary school and middle school, et cetera. Uh, the short guy that gets, you know, picked on until people realize, Hey, this guy actually knows how to handle himself. Uh, don't, don't pick a fight with him. But anytime you're someplace new, you don't have that reputation. So you have to, you have to, fight for that reputation. And, and I, and I guess I've always just been a fighter along those lines. And in fact, I think one time during, uh, check level four, perhaps, or maybe HLC three, you and I were talking and you told me that 
in one of my past lives, you know, I was a warrior and that the reason I took on leukemia in this particular lifetime is because all the real battles, the physical battles were, were gone and there was nothing else. So I needed to create something for my own development in this lifetime. And, and, and honestly, um, that was the hard part about leukemia. I was diagnosed in 2004, 2003, 2004. Um, and you, you don't have an enemy that you can see, you know, it's, it's cellular. It's, it's literally microscopic. And, uh, I was like, you know, just give me a, a, a fucking bad guy to punch in the nose or somebody to run away from, or something I can get strong to, to, to fight against. And there was nothing, nothing tangible. Um, and, and I think that was kind of the hardest part about leukemia specifically for me is there was, there was, it was so nebulous. I couldn't, couldn't put my eyes on anything to focus on. So ultimately, I guess what I had to do was focus on health, you know, and, and if, if I could focus on thinking, breathing, drinking, eating, moving, sleeping in regards to a healthy body, then there would be no way for leukemia to coexist in that body. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned that I did a reading on you and picked up that past life information because honestly, I don't remember doing that. But quite often what happens is it doesn't happen regularly at all <clears throat> but sometimes if somebody's got a real life threatening challenge like that and they approach me personally for help and sometimes just spontaneously like somebody will just be talking to me at a conference or uh in a classroom or whatever and all of a sudden i will find myself in a trance state getting information passed into me for that person so that's probably what happened is is that spirit was passing a message on to you through me uh because i i learned a long time ago don't <laughs> don't start offering that for people otherwise you end up just having people following you around everywhere you go wanting you to tell them everything about their life and it gets to be very draining so i i i don't normally let people know i have those abilities but it's it sounds pretty uh realistic based on what i know about your life <laughs> yeah i mean and I think if anything I took away from that, Paul, is that don't create a battle that doesn't need to be there. You know what I mean? Um, and if anything, I've tried to take leukemia and, one, make it not a part of who I am. So I don't lead off with, hey, I'm Andrew Johnson. I'm having leukemia. I I don't want to get my ego too attached to that so that anything I'm doing to, to rid myself of disease, it gets uh, – destroyed even before I get to fully attempt it, you know, so I don't want to become too attached to it. And then also I, I recognize some of the just blessings that have come from it, whether it be, you know, being able to do something like a race across America and have it mean something more than just, you know, another feather in your cap. Um, or even something as simple as crossing a finish line and, and recognizing that, you know, you are alive enough, well enough, healthy enough to do that. That that's a that's a blessing that I'll freely admit, especially when I was racing bicycles. And if I got second, I'd be pissed off because uh, I didn't win. You know, it 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 puts it in perspective. It makes everything relative. And having a, an appreciation for life just for living that that's not a bad place to be, my friend. Yeah, well, I agree. There's, you know. We have to find ways to grow ourselves. And, and I think one of the problems we have today is people are so happy with being average and, and just existing or just getting by. And I think I'm more like you guys. You know, I've always wanted to find the edges of myself and everything I did. And then when I found the edge, I just wanted to see if I could take it further the next time. And, um, you know, I, I think if we don't really do the things that we need to do to get to know who we are, then we are kind of a, a 24 hour a day question mark. And I think a lot of people are using drugs and junk food and bad television and social media to fill the question mark instead of an honest exploration of themselves, which as you both know, athletics is, is, is really an excellent way to, to kind of explore your potentials. 
Um, Kenny, your circumstances are different in that you were on the team not because you had cancer, but because a family member had cancer, your wife, right? That's right, Paul. My wife and uh, my mother as well. Wow. Yeah. So why don't you share with us what turned you into just the kind of nutcase that can ride a bicycle <laughs> across America as fast as he can go at night with no sleep? And uh, uh, bordering on complete annihilation. <laughs> because quite frankly, I think both of you are fucking crazy. I love you. <laughs> but and, and I'm crazy too. But you guys are a whole new notch of crazy. I was going to say it takes a nut to know one, Paul. But um, yeah, Andrew and I have a lot of similarities, um, as I think we've found over the years. Um I, too, was a latchkey kid, probably from the first grade on, kind of uh, left to hang out at the school, you know, two or three hours after class had let out until my parents could get to pick me up, wow. that kind of stuff. So very early on, I learned how to sort of take care of myself. So from, uh, you know, bullies and so forth, things like that, to, you know, when I did get home sometimes, uh, I'd have to cook for myself or I'd have to end up doing my own laundry. So, and it's not that my parents were neglecting me. It was just sort of the, the working parent kind of model at the time. And that's just how it was. Um, so yeah, I learned from a very early age, I've got to take care of myself. And somewhere in there, I'm not sure where it came from, the competitive side of me, maybe it's inborn, um, it just came out and started very early in school. I was always competitive with uh, first grade, I remember, you know, we'd, we'd have track, uh, during, uh, physical education. And there was a kid that had failed a grade and he was older than me, bigger than me. And he would be the only one who would ever beat me in any of the races. It pissed me off so bad. I couldn't stand it. Um, but <laughs> I know that feeling, <laughs> you know, just like I, I never could quite beat him. I was always just right on his backside, but that was it. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, and then, um, First, first uh, out of my family to go to university, so I had to kind of figure out my way there. Um, you know how to get in. What did I want to do? I had no friggin' clue uh, what I wanted to major in. Um, finally, found found that direction, uh, that dream, uh, with my wife's help. Then my so it would be my wife, um, obviously not at the time. Um, but we, uh, after college, we got married and had our first child a few years later. And that was, that was a difficult thing. Uh, my wife, um, had a very difficult birth. She almost bled out. Uh, wow. Ella was born blue and unresponsive. And, you know, there's a lot of things we wish we'd have known that we've learned through the Czech Institute about birthing and so forth since then. Um, uh, but at that point I had still hadn't found the Institute. Um, you know, fast forward 2010, um, my wife's father committed suicide. Wow. Uh, you know, you start living through some of these nightmares. And like Andrew said a moment ago, it puts a lot of things in perspective. Um, our business that we had built uh, started in nine, 1997. Uh, my wife and I built it. Um, after that suicide, she kind of stepped out. She really wanted to just be with the kids. And, you know, it really affected her deeply. She was close to her father. And um, I took on a business partner. And it was okay. He was a good guy. But there were just some differences and things went sideways a couple of years later. And another prospective partner came in. And unfortunately, during all that process, a couple of trainers I had walked out to probably 50% or more of the business. So, so it was a gym? Yeah, we were a small studio and we had evolved into about a 6,000 square foot facility and it just changed the dynamic. And, um, uh, like I said, just, you know, learned a lot through those lessons about myself. Um, you know, I got really angry for a while and then I realized, you know, I've got to figure out why, why did I make the choices that I made that led to this happening instead of just being pissed and blaming everyone else. Um, so, you know, that's, that's another dynamic is just looking inward at yourself and figuring out what is it I'm doing here? What do I want to do? Uh, am I, is this the right direction? 
Um, I think doing something like I said, some crazy ass race like Ram, you'd better be heading in the right direction as far as uh, why am I out here? Because it's something you don't want to get into if you have no business getting into it. I've had the chance to work with some amazing people and companies over my 37 years of practice. People and companies that are creating life-enriching and ethical products. That work inspired me to partner with many of these companies in our Check Approved shop to bring you some incredible products that I know, love, and trust. And this December is Check Approved Month at the Check Institute. Aho! For the entire month of December, our partners are offering you special discounts on check approved products like pendants from Biogeometry, EMF protection from Aries Tech, essential oils from Essential Oil Wizardry, organic food supplements from Paleo Valley, and ceremonial herbs from Celtic Secret. This is a great way to try out and enjoy products that I know will support you in being your fit, healthy best. And if you still have holiday shopping to do, it's a great way to find presents for your loved ones that everyone, including you, can feel good about. So take a few minutes to explore the Check Approved shop at thechekshop.com forward slash check, C-H-E-K, hyphen approved. That's thechekshop.com forward slash check, hyphen approved. I know you're going to find something that supports you in your health goals and will help you look and feel better and live and love more fully every day. Aho. It sounds to me, uh, Kenny, and probably both you you too, Andrew, that you guys both have a long history of racing bicycles. I know, Andrew, you've done the Tour de France, what, twice? No, 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 I never did the Tour. That's uh, the top level of the cycling world, and honestly... You probably at the time that I was racing had to be doing something illegal at the time. Um, so go, I was, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. So the, the Tour de France at the time, it was 20 teams, the top 18 of which qualified based off points. And that was UCI points from their riders. And then you'd have a couple of invites usually were reserved for the French teams. Um, and I was on tier three teams. I mean, we were, uh, aspiring to get to the, the second level and get to invites to some of the bigger races, some of the, the semi-classics, et cetera. Um, and even some of the smaller tours, but nothing, none of the grand tours, nothing like the tour de France. Um, had you, uh, seen me in the tour de France, it probably would have meant I had, uh, taken something I shouldn't have long, long, long ago. And, uh, for whatever reason, I decided not to do that. And I will tell you straight up, my wife probably had a strong influence in that regard. Well, yeah, I don't doubt it. But the point I was getting at there was both of you uh, have spent countless hours on a bicycle seat, not to mention you, Andrew, with triathlon doing, you've done multiple Ironmen. So my yeah, point I was definitely. driving at is, is, do you find that cycling is a form of meditation for you guys? Because it's a repetitive exercise. It's really the kind of exercise that lets you have that half awake, half asleep dream experience. Yeah, without a doubt. It, it's funny because so I think one of the reasons I'm drawn to cycling specifically is it is meditative, but it's meditative in the fact that you have to be so in the now. Uh because if you're not in that present moment, again, you've got cars, you've got the wheel six inches in front of you, you've got dogs, you've got cracks in the cement, you've got winds, turns, etc. The margin for error is pretty damn small. So you got to be directly in the moment, which I think is um, ultimately what formal types of meditation bring to, to a lot of people, or at least they try to be in that one moment when the only thing that they have is that is that now, that 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 breath, that space between heartbeats, and there's no level of consciousness, but what's right there. And uh, that's, I think that's one of the reasons why I really love cycling and really all athletic endeavors along those lines. And I did some of my best thinking on two wheels. Uh, you know, that may be not putting it, <laughs> not, not a very high bar perhaps, but, uh, I've definitely done some good thinking on two wheels. Well, I think it's plenty high enough. I mean, look at your, your career, look at your books. I mean, shit. I mean, you've done a hell of a lot. Kenny, 
give me a little read on on what cycling means for you and and how you've used that to help heal your your challenges and go deeper into yourself uh, because it's, it seems to me that this must be a meditation for you as well either that or you're just absolutely completely utterly crazy well maybe a little crazy uh you know i've always like i said like growing up uh in the neighborhood i lived in too was all i all i had was my bike there were really no children around much you know we're back in the 70s there growing up and um so riding my bike that was my thing so it's just a love for the for the bicycle for one um actually andrew and i back in 97 were on the same team uh but it's just yeah it's something that's always given me a a release valve you know that part of you know the six principles movement for me that getting out there and you know even uh breathing etc it's just such a incredible feeling to of freedom um and i think that's that, that's a big part of it. it's the freedom it's the the adrenaline rush uh you, you you go a long way in a short time so to speak um as far as you know a runner goes and runs you know typically what three to five miles on average something like that cyclists we're kind of crazy we do 30 to 50 60 70 100 miles so you can cover a lot of ground in an afternoon and see a lot so it's a good way to get out in nature and just see so much we live an hour from the mountains i can be in the mountains and and uh the foothills of the smoky mountains here in tennessee and and back home in three and a half hours yeah since you mentioned the six foundation principles i'll start with you and um uh kenny and how how has the czech institute's education helped you athletically and and even through times of challenge and i know too personally what a suicide in the family is like i don't know if you are aware but my brother committed suicide when i was 35 he was 34 i believe right so i you know i i uh I spent several years recovering from that and, and it's something I don't think you ever fully do recover from, but, uh, um, I know that I had to lean on all the skills I have to keep myself from imploding from that experience. So how have, how has what you've learned through the Czech Institute helped you get through your challenging times since you learned it and then also develop yourself as an athlete? Um, uh, you know, there's so many things we I've gotten from the Institute, Paul. Um, obviously you got the principles, thinking, breathing, movement, hydration, nutrition, and sleep. You've got, uh, three choices, right? Yeah. And <laughs> those three it, choices. <laughs> those three choices, as you said, uh, the pain teacher, I'm one of these uh, dumb asses that has to learn the hard way. It seems <laughs> some of my, some of the choices I've made, uh, yeah. they were not the optimal choice. It was a suboptimal or the indifference, uh, Uh but I'm getting, I'm getting smarter as I get older. Um, but it's, it's having the clarity to see where you're out of balance. And then I can hear you say it, base your spiritual practice around that. And that, those are some of the, I think the best things are just being able to learn that you don't have to go out, but look within to see where the issues are. Quit. Like I said before, don't point your finger. Um, I was saying if I'm pointing my finger, I've got three fingers pointing back. So I mean, it's going to start with me. You mentioned spiritual practice. What are some of the uh, practices that you use that would fall into the category of spiritual practices? Cycling. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's your that's your your uh, meditation center and your kind of be with God time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it really is, um, and I'm I'm getting better. I'm not great at it, but I'm getting better at doing more um, Tai Chi practice and and just uh, meditation, breathing exercises, things of that nature. Um, and again, it's like one of these. I I've had you tell me this before. I've had different practitioners when I first joined the institute. I would tell them, you know, here's my story. Everyone says, meditate, <laughs> meditate. What did I do? Did I go out and meditate? No, I read about meditating. So intellectualizing <laughs> it. That's a start. So, 
<laughs> you know, um, but I'm getting there. But yeah, I would say chi- cycling is my chief meditation. Yeah, well, it, it's it's good. It works. I, I I don't think that, you know, you know, there's all this kind of buzz about spirituality. There's a whole modern new age movement about it, and and I think yeah, it's it's there's some there's some nice things to be gained and learned in there. But really, I think the reason a lot of people have a hard time with meditation is because they think it's something they've got to do. It's like another thing they've got to do. But the reality of it is, is that (laughs) meditation is really a commitment to giving yourself the time to just sit and let your mind Mm. empty itself and then the mistake, of course, is that you try to stop your mind, which I tell people, what is the function of a wheel? And they all say to roll. And I say, good. Well, know that the function of a mind is to think. So every time you try to stop your mind, you're actually using the force of thought to try to stop thought. So you're actually, yeah. you know, it's like you're trying to go two directions at once. It never works very well. But for guys like you guys and and me that have busy lives and, you know, obviously have been through the complications of business and challenging family situations and all that. I think you reach a certain point where if you actually understand meditation as a chance to just sit there and not have to do anything and just watch your mind, like you watch a movie screen and say, boy, look at that mind device. (laughs) My mind just comes up with all sorts of shit. It, you know, it wants to kill the president or wipe Bill Gates out or, you know, well, you just watch the show and it, it gets to be quite entertaining, but there comes a time, and this is why it has to be a practice. There comes a time when all of a sudden you realized the screen has been empty for 10 or 15 minutes and you realize, wow, that was cool. I didn't have to do anything. And then you start noticing that your mind is more clear after that. And you're not as easily perturbed by little things because you now have a reference point to know what it feels like to just be in a state of your own self-acceptance and self-generated peace. So I think personally, uh, you know, I, I'm, there, I've been gone through periods in my time where I did a lot of meditation, but I like contemplative meditation the best. And I'll, I'm going to share this with you both and with everybody, because I think for a lot of people, it's a better way to go. Uh, you know, I, I'm someone that likes to always answer the biggest questions like, who am I? How did I get here? What's life all about? Everyone talks about God, but I don't see a whole lot of godly behavior. So what's the God story all about? And so what I do is I might take a passage from some real deep soul like Carl Jung, Rudolf Steiner, Joseph Campbell, etc., or a poem from Rumi, and it might have a statement in it. And then I will just say, okay, that's quite profound, but let me see if I can really get to what they're really trying to convey here. So I might read the passage three or four times just to sort of imprint it. And then I say to my soul, you know, what is it that Rumi is really saying here? Or what is Joseph Campbell or Carl Jung really trying to teach us here? And then I just go into that empty state, but I hold that question. So it's kind of like leaving the mailbox open. And then I find that if I just relax and go into what I call a listening state, like if you were trying to hear a a child talk to you, but they weren't very loud, you'd have to really focus on listening. So I just use my whole being as an ear. And I just listen for what spirit brings to me. And then all of a sudden, I start getting images or I hear a voice in my head saying, well, what he's really saying is. And then, of course, I dialogue with myself. So can you expand on that? And then I go into listening mode. So for me, what that did was it it allowed me to make my meditations work for me 
because not only did I get the practice of emptying my mind, but I could use it as a vehicle of exploring things that take a lot of time to process. For example, I probably spent three years meditating on one question, which is what is love? What is it really? And after about three years, my soul gave me pieces and pieces, probably just because I wasn't able to take it all in. And that's how I got the love code that I teach in Czech HLC training. But my point in sharing that with both of you is if you don't do contemplative meditation, it's a beautiful way to meditate because it gives you a reason to meditate other than just sitting there. And it gives you a reason to empty your mind, but this time you're emptying it to make room for something profound to come in. And technically, that type of access is called using your intuition, because by definition, intuition is what completes the whole of what the mind cannot give you, because mind always divides. There's always a subject object duality. So when you go into a state of intuitive receptivity, you become pure subject and hold your intention on what you choose to tune into in the cosmic realm, and then it becomes delivered as the object of your awareness. Yeah. Mm. So I, I think that's awesome, Paul. Uh, thank you. I, I just felt inspired to share that with you guys because I don't know if you've done much contemplative meditation, and I was really inspired by uh, Father Thomas Keating, the famous Christian um, monk uh, who Ken Wilber has done a lot of work with. He died a couple of years ago, I think now, but he, he was an old man, but he was really one of the most amazing Christians I've ever studied in my life and, and uh, who in our era left videos. It might be fun for you guys to look up Father Thomas Keating on the internet and find some of his interviews with people like Sam, Tammy Simon and Ken Wilber, um, because he was really into contemplative meditation. And Joseph Campbell was a real contemplative meditator. And many of the people that I've studied that are the greatest minds I've studied were contemplative meditators. So that's what sparked me on to contemplative meditation, which I've been doing literally all my life, it just because it was just really the only way I could solve problems that nobody could give me answers for. Uh, yeah. Andrew, you want to share a little about how the Czech Institute training and, and principles helped you through, because you've been through a hell of a lot. I mean, not, not that Kenny or, or any of us haven't, but you, you have been through some ball buster challenges. And, and um, I'm not really trying to do this to promote the Institute as much as I am saying there must be something to these principles or guys like you wouldn't keep using them. And I think it's important yeah, no. for people to understand these are universal principles. I'm just one of the few guys that brought the most essential things into one package and systematized it so people could learn how to use them. Right. I mean, when, when I talk about you, Paul, to some of my friends or people who believe it or not, haven't heard of you, I'm like, this is a guy, you know, ninth grade education, but what he did is he went and found the best people in their various fields and he studied underneath them and, and became uh, a sponge for the information that they were sharing. And then he was consolidating that information and then he's sharing it with all his students and everybody he's talking to on his podcast. So, I mean, uh, I, I greatly appreciate that. I've tried to, to use my, uh, my own business model as the same kind of thing. I'm trying to consolidate all the shit that I've learned and all the shit that I've gone through to try to save my clients, my friends, my family, my loved ones, the pain and suffering that I've had to go through to learn some of these harder lessons. Because it's while it's it's nice to learn the stove is hot by touching the stove, it still burns, you know. So it's yeah. it's, it's it's if you don't have to be uh, if you don't have to have that lesson, I think it's not a bad uh, way to go about learning vicariously, if you will, through through other people. But as far as the Czech Institute, I want to specifically talk about uh, the meditation just because you, you talked about it just then. The, the process of going from, for somebody like me and Kenny, riding bicycles down a mountain at 60 miles an hour then to just sitting still, while that would be some great, you know, yin to our yang, it was almost too tough a transition for me. So the thing that I think worked great for me at first and presented me um, uh, uh, easier an option where you're working in exercises. You're 
you know, zone one exercise, zone two, zone three. And the year that I really took it on was in 2012. And I, I uh, was seven years, not seven years. I was uh, four years off of doing anything athletic. And I decided that I wanted to win an Ironman partly because I was watching the Tour de France or something like that with my son. And my, my, my son said, did you used to do that, dad? He was young at the time. I was like, yeah, yeah. I used to race bicycles. It's like, man, I'd really love to see. It. I was like, oh, dude, done. So I said, baby, I talked to my wife. Uh, I want to come back and start doing triathlons, which I pretty much retired from to open a business, write a book, become a dad, etc. And she gave me permission, which is the first, you know, hurdle. And uh, then I was like, but I need something. I, I don't want to just race, you know, normal. Tri I, I want to win an Ironman. Like, I don't want to just race the Ironman and finish. The, I want to win an Ironman. And I had said back in 2004 when I was first diagnosed, hey, people, don't worry about me. I'm going to be the first leukemia survivor to ever win an Ironman. More to, to make people stop looking at me like I was dying because they, when they saw you, they, they, they knew you were dying and they would just look at you with sympathy. And I like, I don't need your sympathy. I'm going to come back and kick everybody's ass. Watch. So <laughs> one of the things I know I needed back in 2012, if I was going to make this comeback, was to truly work in. So I made myself a promise I was going to do a gong, 100 days of practice, right, of at least 10 minutes of zone exercises a day, you know, and it didn't matter what zone it was. I just let whatever felt comfortable. Sometimes it was a, a breathing squat. Sometimes it was alternate nostril breathing, whatever it was. And I truly think that's one of the reasons why I was able to win the overall of the Ironman in 2012. And just to give you a, an idea of the connection to spirit, which I know you know, but some people may not get, you start to get into a level of consciousness, that universal consciousness where stuff, amazing shit happens. That's where potential lies, right? And I'm out there uh, in, on, on the beach, uh, Sunset Beach, which is near Myrtle, where you used to, to ride your bike to. And uh, I go out in the morning put my feet about, you know, eight, 10, 12 inches in the ocean as it's, it's uh, coming up into the shore. The sun hasn't even started to rise yet, but it's coming up, you know, just, just across the horizon. I'm the only one on the beach, you know, making the first tracks in the sand. It's freaking beautiful. And I'm doing my, uh, like the energy push, if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm doing that. My eyes are closed. It's freaking awesome. And then I finally feel like, okay, it's t I'm done with my practice. I open my eyes, I turn around, and there's a freaking deer on the beach. Now, I've never seen a deer on the beach, and I've been going to that beach for 30-something years at that time. I still haven't seen a deer on the beach after that, and I don't know what that was about, but it was absolutely amazing. And, and stuff like that just started to happen to me more and more often um, as, as, I, as I delved into this practice of, of um, I, I don't know, one meditating but then also realizing there is more than me there it's there, there's an there's that 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 we and the all principle there's and it's all one all at the same time and that's a very easy thing to talk about academically and then it's another thing to experience it and then know it for sure um so I, i've just gone off on a freaking tangent paul but everything that you've taught the institute from the thinking the breathing the drinking the eating the movement the sleep to stuff that you don't even talk about here uh, and that you've gotten a lot of shit for because like I've been with you for a long time since my first class with you was probably in 95, 96 or something like that uh, where I learned how to train the lower abdominals. I remember um, anyways, and you approached your work with most people, I would say at the physical level. And, and yet I know you've always been an incredibly spiritual person. And then when you finally started to, push the spiritual aspect in the Czech Institute a little bit more. I know you got a lot of shit and it, like half your, your practitioner said, what the fuck, Paul? And, and got pissed at you and left and other people who you never thought you might reach to started to start listening to you. But what I'm getting at is that aspect that you teach is the thing that kind of kept me going. The physical is maybe what keeps you alive, but the spiritual is what keeps you driven to stay alive. If that makes mm. sense. Yeah. It feeds the soul. Without a doubt. I mean, it's, it's nice to, to eat a steak, 
maybe, but when you sit down there and you honor the energy and the love and the sacrifice that has gone to bringing that steak to your table and you're trying to take that sacrifice and bring it into your body and make it something even better so that you can then go forth and help the world with that, that steak tastes so much better, I can guarantee to you. Plus, to me, that's really living. You know, I, as you know, I say love is a boomerang. And I think, I think when we just keep taking and taking and taking without conscious awareness of the sacrifice that the plants and the animals and the world makes for our existence, if you don't have that awareness, then life really just becomes uh, a a tube with a set of teeth at one end and an asshole at the other end that just keeps eating everything up. And, and, you know, as you both know, we're about, we've about eaten the world out. There's not much left. And we've, we've killed so much life unconsciously. So for me, the spiritual practice is what really ultimately brings things into meaning and helps you realize yourself as part of the great chain of being and realize that we're not just material beings, you know, our bodies are material, but our minds and our souls, our, our sense of self is something far beyond the material realm. Once you reach the point of realizing that who you are is incredibly vast, but the experience that you're having is utterly dependent upon the resources of nature to the degree that your wife and your kids and your business and, and your life and your hobbies and your friendships and the beauty of nature are important to you, which is a spiritual awareness, you wake up to the fact that if your life doesn't sustain or support the sustaining of these things, then you're really, you don't really have much meaning to your life. You might as well just be a machine. And and that to me that doesn't ever leave you inspired to wake up the next day. And I think a lot of that's why there's so much anxiety, depression, and suicide in the world today. Exactly. Hi everybody. One of my all-time favorite enzyme products in the world, bar none, is Masszymes from Bioptimizers. This is a broad spectrum enzyme that works amazingly well. But since Wade Lightheart is co-founder of Bioptimizers and knows the intimate details of it, I wanted Wade to let us know how it is that Masszymes works so well. Wade, how does this product work so well? Well, first and foremost, it combines 17 different enzymes, including five different types of proteolytic enzymes, which work in the full spectrum, anywhere from two pH of 2 to a pH of 12. So it'll cover all your bases on whatever your digestive or dietary needs are. We also combined it with an enzyme enhancer called Astrozyme, which improves enzymatic function by 30 to 60%. There's no weird additives or flow regulators inside of it. And our recent research in our university lab in Europe has proven that it also produces antioxidants inside the body, which makes it doubly incredible. That's an amazing product. And I use it every day. I take five in the morning and five at night. And in the morning, I throw two Capex in just to give a little energy magic. And it's absolutely amazing. I feel fantastic. And even as a guy that's about to turn 60, I can still put it on the young guys. So thank you, Bioptimizers. To try Masszymes for yourself, go to Masszymes, M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S dot -E com forward slash living number four, capital D, and enter the code capital P, capital A, capital U, capital L, 10, that's Paul in all caps with a 10 behind it, to get 10% off this product and any other Bioptimizers products you'd like. And of course, Masszymes comes with Bioptimizers 100% money back guarantee. So there is no risk if you don't like it. Just send it back and you'll get your money back. Enjoy. Nobody has intention, really. And when I say nobody, not enough people. I mean, you need the intention uh for exercise to make the exercise work for you you need the intention for uh diet to make a diet work for you and you really need intention for life to make that life work for you i mean if, if you're waking up to and, and you have no reason to wake up that's that's when you're like well fuck it i don't i won't wake up i mean 
And and I think I talked to you about this when we were visiting right before Ram and, you know, Kenny and I came out and you let us hang out with you for several hours and hang out with Angie and ate a little bit of food and stuff. Um, that my, one of my best friends in high school killed himself like three weeks, four weeks before a race across America started. And, um, it, it's funny because I didn't even know that I was as close to him. I'd been, uh, able to feel the energy of people passing through me when they died, like my granddad, uh, on my father's side, when he passed, uh, and then my grandmother on my mom's side. But this guy, when he died, I, I, I felt, I felt the sadness. I felt the, the, the weight of everything that had led him to commit suicide. And I told my wife, look, baby, you don't have to worry about me. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I understand why he gave up. And I don't think it's selfish at all. He was just at his wits end. And if I felt like that all the time myself, I think I would do the same thing because it, it literally was not worth it. And it was wild, Paul, because I was in the best shape of my life. Uh, well, as far as my, my old life, let's put it that way. Uh, and um, I remember going for a ride shortly after I, I uh, found out about my friend dying. And um, I, I was going to ride long the next day. But I woke up that Saturday morning to go do my long ride and I could barely get down the stairs because I was so incredibly sore. And I, I don't get sore from the bike. I haven't been sore from the bike in 20 freaking years, 30 years. I don't know because I ride the bike every day and I was just destroyed and it was it was crazy. And of course, had no energy. I was crying all the time. Um, no appetite, no sexual appetite either, which is is ask my wife and she, she'll tell you that that's unusual. Um, yeah. Uh, but so, and, and that lasted, uh, solidly for a few days, but I was really worried because we were getting close to the start of Ram. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to bounce back from that. And in fact, it wasn't until maybe the week that Ram started that I felt back to normal on any level. It literally energetically took a lot out of me. And, and I tell you, if, if that sensation, if that power, if you will, is getting stronger in me as the years pass and I'm able to to synthesize what other people are going through. That's it's it's awesome, but it sucks at the same time because man, it was so powerful and to, to experience that again is a scary proposition. I mean, um I don't I don't want to I don't want to experience that again almost because it's 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 intimidating to say the least. Yeah, it, it it's it's very painful. It's about the closest thing I could say to being gutted alive. Yeah. You don't really realize how much you love someone till they're gone. Well, and, and it's crazy because we were high school friends, best friends. But I think what we had was a connection because we had, believe it or not, we had rafted down a creek shortly after a rainstorm in Atlanta. And we, we nearly died, both of us. And we'd gone under this bridge and I hit my head and, thought I was dying at the time when I swam to the surface, I looked over and my friend is just unconscious doing the dead man's float. And I grab him and pull him to the shore and hold onto a tree limb until this, uh, our friends that we were with could pull us both out. And I think maybe that, that was our connection. And, uh, for whatever reason, when I lost him, it was, it was, it was brutal there for a while. Yeah. Kenny, what fears did you have going into Ram? And what were you most excited about? Uh, you know, I, I I guess I'm crazy. I didn't really have any fears. If I were going to give you a fear, though, it was going to be something would happen to me that I would let the team down, that I couldn't, you know, pull my own weight. And yeah. That's, <laughs> that's the one that concern or fear that I had. Yeah, that's, I think that's one of the, things that team sports really helps us um, grow our sense of self. You know, when you're, I'll give you an example. When I was in the 82nd Airborne Division, one of the most profound experiences I've ever had in my life is every year they do what's called the 82nd Airborne Division March. It's one thing to be marching in step, singing cadences and you know songs with 250 soldiers in your company. 
that feels powerful. I mean, when 250 guys' feet hit the ground at exactly the same time and you're all singing, it's like being in a massive men's choir, you know. Uh, actually, there's occasionally a, a few women in there. We had a woman in our company. Um, but 14,000 of us marching at the same time, the sound of that was phenomenal. I bet you could hear it five or six miles away. and the power of it is so significant that when there's a bridge we have to cross on the march. It's a huge bridge, like a four lane highway, but they have to stop us and make us march out of step because that many men on the bridge marching in step will literally crumble the entire bridge. Wow. Now you're talking about a bridge that you can drive six army tanks across at the same time. I mean, literally a four-lane highway with huge steel beams and and supports, right? But human beings marching in step can literally vibrate that thing into sh sh uh, shrapnel. So the point I'm driving at is when, you know, I fought on a 30-man boxing team. We We lived together before major tournaments. We had to sleep in the barracks together, so we were doing everything together 24 hours a day. And, you know, we were competing at, at the highest levels against Cuba, Russia, you know, major forces in athletics. So you really develop this sense of connection and even doing battle maneuvers. There's a lot of stress and competition and trying not to get knocked out or, or, you know, cause your team to lose points so that you don't look like the village idiot and all that. But I think there's just a lot as men, I know women have their own ways of doing it, but I think men have a hard time being really healthy if they don't have connection to other men that inspire them and do things together and to realize that you can't really do anything meaningful in the world by yourself. That's one of the things I think <clears throat> that the trap of the ego is, is you can you know, I've said to many people in my classes, I don't care if you can squat a thousand pounds if you can't get along with your wife and kids, you know, because so many, as you guys know, men get into all their athletic pursuits and look, look how big my muscles are. Look how much I can deadlift, squat, bench press, whatever, but they don't grow themselves personally or interpersonally or spiritually. So you just get a meathead out of that deal. But when you're Working with men to accomplish something significant, like, you know, getting across the United States on a bicycle as fast as you can or, uh, you know, accomplishing a military objective or <clears throat> when I worked in aircraft weapon systems repair on helicopters, you know, we had, I don't know, probably 20 of us. But we we're a priority one unit, which meant if any helicopter broke down, we had to work nonstop until it was fixed because we're the first ones to go to war anywhere in the world. So nothing can be broken down. So there was times when all of us were working for 36 hours straight to get equipment battle ready. But you just you learn to go beyond your sense of personal self into a collective self. And I don't know about you guys, but I really think we've lost that in the entire United States of America. I think we've just become so fractured and so lost in, in our eyeness and so divided by all this COVID stuff. And, and we've so many people have lost their sense of and spirit of freedom that they're just rolling over and just being passive little zombies and not thinking for themselves, questioning things and researching things. It's almost like they're just been raised on Count Chocula, soda pop and television. And they believe that's God, you know? Right. So I was going to follow that up, Paul, with, you know, we were writing for pediatric cancer research, right? So we were paired with uh, eight children who were fighting cancer. Um, the child I was paired with, his name was Jeremiah. He was five years old. Uh, full of life. There's a video of him dancing around and everything. So we did a Zoom call one afternoon and he you know, was just talking and walking around. They, they'd stopped on the road. They were en route to uh, a hospital there in Miami where he was going to undergo a week of treatment. So each of his treatments were a week long. And he got up and he goes, look, look. And he's walking 
through the aisles. And his mother says, well, he's showing you he can walk because two weeks ago he was so weak from the treatment he couldn't walk. Yeah. So, you know, and that, in that moment I was like, and I, I was like, you know, this little boy, he's five years old. who has a, a disease that's, you know, just unspeakable, you know, is, is showing me he can walk and he's happy he can walk. We, you know, and that just like tore, you know, tore your heart in half. Yes. And, you know, each of we, as well as the team, we, we also rode for friends and family members that had cancer, had fought it, beat it. Those we'd lost. Um, in 2018, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had to have a double mastectomy and she's fortunately happy and healthy still today. Um, but in 2019, my mother was diagnosed with gastric cancer and she, we lost her almost a year to the day from the time we started the, or finished Ram. Um, so, you know, each time I got on a bike, I felt like that, you know, all those people were with me, you know, especially the people that were, I was close to and I was riding, you know, getting as much strength from them, uh, as, you know, we'll say all the training had given me. Um, and the whole way I felt particularly close and, and had conversations with my mother, uh, you know, just kind of asking the, Hey, this is some dangerous shit out here. Let's keep us all safe. And you know, you've got semis with crosswinds and, you know, yeah, uh, just some crazy stuff we're out there. And it's, it really is kind of questionable at times, but yeah, it's just having all those people and, and, and riding in honor of them. And, you know, like Andrew knows it best. Um, it was just a really, on, a real honor um, to be a part of that. Yeah. Andrew, did you have any <laughs> reservations or concerns going in? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, just just leaving family, you know, even though this is a um, a communal effort and it was, you know, seven guys that were racing, eight guys on the team. But then you got 12 crew members and then all the people that Kenny talked about that either had already passed or were fighting cancer and the kids as well. Um, you know, it's, you're, you're doing stuff that for all these people, but it's also still, still a kind of a very selfish thing. Um, so there, there is, there is that my, my fears going into it was always, yeah, it's the same kind of thing as Kenny didn't want to let people down. And in fact, um, I was lucky I had Kenny there and I was lucky, hell, I was lucky on a lot of different levels. So shortly before the race started, I think I told you this, Paul, I had to, we have to get tested to, to, make sure that you don't have uh, COVID, you know, in the, in the era of COVID. And so I got my first and only test uh, two days before, maybe a day before. No, it was the day before, I think. Uh, and immediately within an hour after getting the test done, my neck started tightening up. And by the next day, I couldn't turn my neck. You know enough about riding a bicycle to know that if you can't turn your neck, you can't ride a bike, at least not safely. I mean, it's dangerous as hell. Um, and luckily, we had a chiropractor there, Richard, one of the um, one of the cyclists, uh, a woman there who was part of the crew. Uh, her name's Carrie, and she was a massage therapist. Kenny, an excellent manual therapist, uh, did some work on me as well. And of course, every trick up the sleeve that I've learned through the Czech Institute and otherwise, I was practicing on myself. But I was starting the race off thinking, holy shit, I'm going to let people down from the get go because I don't even know if I can ride when the race starts on Saturday, cause it was, it was Tuesday and I couldn't freaking move my neck. Funny story. So, uh, Kenny or somebody told me, actually it was, uh, a massage therapist buddy of mine. He said, if you take two shots of whiskey, not only will your neck be fine, but you'll sleep like a baby. All right. Kenny remembers <laughs> this. Uh, and, and cause I was having trouble sleeping, you know, you need, you need your neck to sleep because when you move around your, your head's supporting you, whether you realize or not. And I was realizing, that shit, uh, you can't sleep when your neck's destroyed. Um, so I was, I was desperate to do anything. I haven't had a drink of alcohol since my bachelor party 26 years ago tomorrow. Okay. Uh, is when I was married. Um, and, uh, so I asked Kenny to pour me a couple shots of whiskey. I think, wasn't it you that poured it for me, Kenny? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> All right. So he, <laughs> that's a he, good buddy. I tell, it was, it I, I tell him, Kenny, shot, and I, buddy. he's a witch. Well, I told him, look, I, I told him I, I haven't had a drink, so I probably only need one shot. So he pours me three. He says it's a double. 
it, he pours me three for damn sure. Uh, and this is whiskey or whatever it was. And, and so I, I do the first, try to d- get it down in one shot, get about half of it down, make a gross face because alcohol tastes like shit to me. And then I do the second shot, which he couldn't believe I did because it was, it was enough to do. Anyways, you know what that did for me that night, Paul? You know what it did for me? Knocked you to sleep. Absolutely jack shit, nothing. It didn't do a thing. I didn't sleep. My neck didn't get better. I'm one of those guys that alcohol doesn't affect uh, medicines. When I got hit by a car, they're giving me morphine and they're like, hey, can you, are, you, are you okay? I'm like, I still feel everything. If I've ever had oral surgery, they can't get me numb. I'm just, the, the, the pain stuff doesn't work on me for whatever reason. So alcohol didn't do shit for me and it didn't help. All I did was, uh, have a bad taste in my mouth because uh, it, I didn't sleep. I didn't do anything. That's how desperate I was to do something for the team though, because I didn't want to let the team down. I was desperate. I was, I was going against my own morals, my own training in the six foundational principles in the Czech Institute. And, and, and I'll do anything. I would have done just about anything to be able to show up on the starting line healthy. Yeah. Well, you did it and, and it's behind you. So congratulations to both of you. Cause it's it's uh it's not an easy thing to do. What was your uh, biggest takeaway leaving the event for each of you? Maybe I'll go with you, Kenny, first. Uh, you know, it was it was just an amazing feeling to accomplish that with all the people, and and I was really in awe of the crew that was there supporting us. Because, and again, due to COVID, much of our crew, and I, I think, I don't know how many it was, Andrew, 12 people maybe that were, sp- were supposed to come over from the UK and crew for us. Yeah. We lost all of them as well. So this wow. is like a week and a half, two weeks maybe before the race. So all these people came forward and sacrificed, you know, time, money, uh, sleep, <laughs> et cetera. Sleep for sure to help us out and take our crap when we got pissed and things of that nature. And, you know, it was just really cool. And we had one of the best crews with us that, I mean, I think they made it what it was personally. I I think it would have been a much different experience overall, but it was so, like I said, it was just an honor and, uh, it, it makes you realize what the human potential is, you know, what you can do with the right training, with the right, you know, attention to the foundational principles and making the right choices and understanding when you're out of balance and when you need rest and all those things. Um, so it just really drives home again, like what you've done and put together with the Institute as far as it, it, this shit works. And it's having that, <laughs> it's, it's having that perspective and, and that experience. Um, and there's just no denying it. So, that, you know, that was a, I'd say that was my, my takeaway there was just the, the overall appreciation of all the people that just gave, gave it all for all of us. And then we got to give yeah. back, you know, Andrew, what was your big takeaway? S- similar to, to Kenny in that, you're you're definitely you're a tiny little speck in this earth going across the country but you're actually start with a small wave that makes a bigger wave because i think the number of people we impacted raising over i mean almost a third of a million dollars for pediatric cancer uh pretty impressive for you know eight, eight guys uh and, and the crew members and stuff uh so you you take that that iness that you think that is definitely kind of epidemic these days, and you make it a solid. You t- not only you go through we, you go to all, and 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 you you're, you're doing something that's that's bigger than you. It's more monumental than you, and, and and that ultimately is is just very empowering. And I haven't done a race like an Ironman or something like the Race Across America where I didn't get across the finish line. And just for whatever reason, completely fall into tears. And so for this one, and you'll see this in the documentary, there was a documentary crew following us and they did an amazing job. And that, that'll be coming out sometime next year, I guess. But 
I wasn't expecting my wife to be there because it just logistically it wasn't going to happen. She had to pick up my son from camp and some stuff like that. And so I knew um, that the, everybody else was going to have a loved one there. And I wasn't, which was fine because I knew these people loved me. I knew uh, that you were all the way on the other side of the country thinking about our, our finish and that, that you love me. But still, you want you you want somebody to be there. And uh, the documentary crew was able to to fly her up, surprise me. And so my biggest takeaway there is that, God damn, I love my wife. It's it's you know it's <laughs> good thing. And, and and every time I've been either under the uh, influence, if you will, of plant medicine, or even after I've been concussed, which has happened three times that we know of. One of the things that keeps shining through is every single time it's, I want to be around people who love me and I I love my wife. And so one of the things they tell you about head injuries is sometimes it brings the true, true being of who you are to the surface. And it's kind of nice to know that what I am at my root, and I bet all of us truly are, is love. Um, Because, um. you know, doing a race like that, 3,000 miles across the country in six days with no sleep uh, and all these sacrifices that are being made in your honor and for you will make you realize how truly loved you are. And uh, if 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 these people can love you, you better learn to love yourself, you know? Yeah, that's exactly why in my teachings on the three choices, I say, you know, the best choice you can make is always the one that's best for everybody on your dream team. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Shervin Jaffaria, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Shilaj minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their biocharge activated coconut charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis liposomal glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. So, Andrew, um, you know, what's next for you athletically? I, um, You know, I am always marveled that you seem to keep upping the freaking ante but i don't know what you're going to do now except run around the world on barefooted backwards or something yeah I, so I, I told my wife back in 2012 that if i could win the overall of an iron man that i could walk away from triathlon for good and and for the most part i've kept to my my word with that you know i've done two races across america now a few other little things here and there but i've had in the back of my head for the longest time wanting to do the solo race across America. So this was a team event and solo is a completely different endeavor. In fact, I trained a guy who, this was his third attempt this year. Um, and he, he finally did it. His name is Eric Newsom. Uh, and the first two times he failed the second time he got within 200 miles, but he was so sleep deprived. He was hallucinating and seeing turns on the road that weren't there. And just, he became a danger to himself, became a danger to everybody on the road. So his crew had to decide, hey, that's it. You're done. We can't, we can't go on any longer. And even though I know how horribly bad this is for the human body, mostly because of your teachings. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, ignorance would have been bliss, but I know it's not healthy. And yet there's still part of me that wants to do it. And I know that if I were to be able to do it, the only reason, A, I would be successful or B, be able to survive it is because of everything I've learned through the Institute. Um, And yet, I turned 50 uh, 
in, the, in January, January 5th. And so it would be monumental to do it for my 50th and do it next year. But I also want to stay married. Um, I have a son to raise. So I don't think it's going to happen anytime terribly soon. Um, so what's next for me athletically? Um, I don't know anything athletically. I still have four or five more books to get written and published. And um, I just, I keep wanting to work on my spiritual self, you know, and um, I'm doing a, for my 50th birthday, I'm doing another uh, couple of ayahuasca journeys uh, with a shaman and several of my clients. So I'm looking forward to what that growth will entail. And then um, hopefully doing something similar again uh, in 2022 with my wife, because I want to share that with my wife as well. Well, sounds to me like you're going from a race across America to the race across the universe with that one. <laughs> yeah, baby. That, that's, that's for sure. Without a doubt. You'll be finding some black holes and doing some worm, worm travel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kenny, um, what's next for you? May I ask uh, if you have any athletic endeavors up your sleeve or are you going to just meditate for a while now? <laughs> uh, well, a little both. Um, I'm going to get back into road cycling um, and uh, do a little bit more of that. I've really taken a lot of time off since our children were born, and that's been quite some time, um, other than Ram, of course. And like Andrew, I'm kind of going the spiritual path, we'll say, more uh, more intently at these days. So uh, studying some of Michael Harmer's work. I think I shared that with you and Angie when we were out in California that's, there. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I, I recently studied some of um, Ali McCusick's, uh sound healing. So I'm doing a little bit of that as well. Yeah, that's great stuff, too. She's a genius. You know, I've had her on the podcast. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Well, actually, before I move on, I wrote a note I wanted to share with, with you guys and the listeners. You know, one of the things that sometimes gets misunderstood about my teachings not that I'm saying that you guys misunderstand it, but what triggered me was Andrew when you said, I wish I hadn't known these principles because I wouldn't realize how bad I was trashing myself and ignorance yeah. would be bliss. But it, it it really brings up a very important point about, <clears throat> about my teachings. And as you know, I teach in my love model, I before we always and we before all always. And many people, especially with Christian upbringings, you know, get a little challenged or triggered by that. And they say things like, oh, that's just terribly selfish. Why would you say something like that? Or uh, sometimes uh, a, a number of occasions over the years and even on podcasts where, where I was being interviewed by a woman and we were talking about these things, they'd say, well, you know, that's just not realistic. How am I supposed to do that when I've got kids and a husband and all this other stuff? And I said, well, what do you do when you get sick and you can't do anything? then you can't follow that rule. And now they're, you are their dependent. So now instead of supporting them, you, you have to be supported by them because you didn't manage yourself in a way that's effective for you or your commitment to the relationship. So one of the key things is we can't give what we don't have. So if we don't fill ourselves with our own love and our own joy and take responsibility for meeting our sexual needs, if getting them met by a partner turns out to be stressful to them or, you know, being responsible for carrying our share of the load, whether it means paying bills or cleaning the house or however we divide the, the labor of a relationship up, if we don't take care of ourselves and, and look at, am I taking responsibility for my own happiness or am I expecting someone else to make me happy? Am I moving my body adequately that I don't become a codependent in the relationship and have everyone else have to pick up for me and deal with my problems? Am I eating in ways that minimize my risk of unnecessary illness and disease? And am I resting enough to really be there when I need to be there? If, if we don't do that 
and we give ourselves to other people, then we become victims of poor values and poor um, barriers. We have to have barriers, you know, and and if we go out and try, you know, I'm, a, I'm very all oriented. That's where I kind of get in trouble in relationships because I can be so concerned about the issues of the world. Like, you know, I'm the driving force behind me writing my new book is it's dead obvious to me that people in general need a much broader conception of what life is all about and why we're all here and why the world's constantly full of problems and, and to give people tools to navigate them. So what happens to me is I get so swept up in issues of the world that I don't make enough time for my personal relationships. I'm, I'm very good at making sure I get my exercise in and my meditation or Tai Chi or spiritual practices in because I can't really get to the point of having enough mental clarity to deal with the issues of the world or even people's lives like I do as a therapist all the time. But I tend to fall into the trap of, you know, saving the world kind of thing, which I know is not possible to do, but it just seems to be the way my soul is oriented. But when it comes to the realities of someone dying in the family or someone getting a disease in the family or somebody really truly needing our help, if we don't honor our I-ness and take care of ourselves, then when trouble comes, we have no reserves. And it can, it can just be one small event. And the next thing you know, we're completely incapacitated. We don't have the reserves to help t- take care of the kids or to do the extra job to make the money to pay the bills because somebody's sick in the hospital or to deal with having the energy to be part of a world change. Like right now, it's got to be all hands on deck or we're going to lose our sovereignty. We're going to lose our nation. We're going to lose our constitutional rights. And it's happening right in front of us. But there's only a small percentage of people that are actually awake and, and sitting there meditating on solutions instead of just going, oh, my God, I guess I need to go take this shot or whatever, or I'm not going to get to drive my car, which is completely the wrong approach. I mean, that that's just like uh, becoming a victim to an illusion of victimhood, meaning you're being captured by an illusion without even looking into it. Point being is if you don't have enough resources to participate in your own care and participate in your relationships with your family, and then you come to a crisis like the world's going through right now, you've got nothing to give. And whenever you're under-reserved, you don't have any creative thinking abilities because your body is totally self-oriented as Maslow's hierarchy of needs and Claire Graves' structure stages of values memes show. Once you start getting into physical problems of any kind, your uh, consciousness is oriented toward yourself. So you become totally, utterly self-centered as a survival mechanism. So. The other part of this is that in order to do a race across America or a a hardcore Ironman or any real hardcore athletic event like that, if you don't have enough discipline in your four doctors and six foundation principles, then you won't have the reserves to make it through sleeplessness and and long-term fatigue. Therefore, you, you end up having to deal with the guilt, shame, and pain of your own self-judgment. Because when you look back and say, why didn't I complete the race, but my buddies did, or my team members did, then you have to stand in the mirror and deal with the reality of, of copping out on yourself. So I, I think it's really important for everybody to remember that as challenging as it can be in a relationship or to be a mother with kids or God forbid, a single mother, I think that's where we have to be creative. And that's where the old saying comes from. It takes a tribe to raise a child. And so if we don't develop networks of friends or find other mothers that have the same needs or other people that have similar needs and find out, you know, for example, if we lived close enough, but we were all in a situation where we didn't have time to train together. I could say, okay, Andrew, I'm going to come over to your house and watch your kids for two hours, will you go train? 
And tomorrow I need you to come watch my kids for two hours so I can go train. And then one of us is going to go to Kenny's house. And that way we could actually support each of us in getting our I needs met while doing our, our, our we for each other, which then makes us good examples for the rest of the world at the all level. So I, th- I think one of the real traumas that's happened in the world is with all this, you know, bogus segregation and mandating and, and isolating people. People haven't been very creative either to looking into the real issues to say, you know, and a lot of people don't know a mandate is not a law. You know, they think it's a law. So they don't really realize that they're being tricked into something by a, a corporate enterprise that really has only money of interest. And so what happens is they they start falling into this inability to care for themselves, which leads to groups of people when they get together, like a family in one house, not getting along, which then leads to more arguments, more violence and more stress, which then makes people weak and susceptible to the manipulation of people behind the puppet show because they don't have the reserves to think for themselves, be creative or contribute to educating and creating awareness amongst the others that, that we're all, you know, being played with here. So I wanted to share that just so that everybody listening understands that my concept of I, we all came from years and years of study practice and dealing with thousands of broken lives. And almost always, Whenever I was dealing with diseases, in probably nine cases out of 10, there was always a statement, I don't have time. I don't have time to shop for real food. I don't have time to research for organic farms. Well, you've got a lot of time now. You're you're spent six months in bed and you're almost dead and you're coming to me after spending a half a million dollars on medical approaches that didn't do anything but make you worse. So at the end of the day, if you invest the time into those four doctors and six foundation principles, you have the vitality, the energy, and the creativity to really truly be there in your relationships and to really truly be there in the world and to also have the reserves to really stretch yourself in any athletic endeavor or challenge that can come in your life. And I I just think that this is such a misunderstood issue in our culture and most cultures worldwide that it's, it was, I felt compelled to, to restate that. Hi everybody. You know, people from around the world are constantly asking me where they can find organic foods and supplements that are actually organic, not just some fake impersonation, which is sadly so common in the marketplace today. My most common suggestion is go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, where you can find a wide range of excellent nutritious products made from certified organic source materials. Organifi has superfood drinks that actually taste great, (laughs) unlike most, immune support products, excellent high-quality protein powders, digestive support, joint support, liver support, green juice, hormonal support, and menstrual ease nutrition formulated by a team of female herbologists for women and more. My family and I and a significant number of my clients and friends and students from around the world use and love Organifi products because they're nutritious, taste great, and unlike many products, you actually get what you pay for. Hallelujah! I love Organifi's high values and high quality products and they're excellent for athletes, children, and the whole family. There's no better investment than investing in your own health and well-being. And when it comes to investing in my health and the health of my family, I go to Organifi. If that's not enough to make you want to explore all the amazing products waiting for you at Organifi, I'd love to sweeten the deal for you by offering you a special Living 4D with Paul Check discount of 20% on any of Organifi's excellent certified organic super clean nutritious products by using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K20 on checkout. That's Check 20, all caps, on checkout. I hope you enjoy Organifi as much as my family and I do. No, I think that's perfect, Paul. I mean, I think the I, we, all concept is is almost like biochemistry, which is kind of changing from moment to moment. So, you know, you have to have your I before you can truly be in a we, in an all relationship. But there are times where you consider the all and sacrifice a little I 
because ultimately you realize it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's just like, would I risk my life to save my son's life, to save my wife's life, to save your life? Hell sure. Yeah. It, and that, but that's not I first supposedly, but so there's times where it changes. And yet, like you said, you can't give what you don't have. I tell people all the time, if you don't love yourself, how can you love somebody else? And, and, and with, with my personal experience, I see it more often in women than I do with men. I think guys tend to be a little bit better at the I-ness, if you will, whereas women oftentimes find their, um, I don't know, their idea of who they are in sacrifice for others. And ultimately, I think that can be self-defeating in that sooner or later, the universe says, it's time to pay attention to you. And the, and the tr truth of the matter is, you are worth choosing you on your own team first. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yes. Yes. If you want to be on the team, you might as well bring something to the team. And there's always sacrifices. I mean, especially once you have kids. I mean, the, the, the day you have a child, your life is changed forever. And I don't, you know, the, the, the kind of fortunate, unfortunate thing is, when my kids wake up crying at night, having a nightmare or need mommy or whatever, if I go to them, they just push me away because they know I don't have boobies and, and it's daddy. They're like, no, we want, we want mommy or penny. So even though I try to sacrifice to support them, it just doesn't work. But, you know, Angie's been away for a week. She just got back a few minutes ago. So Penny's been handling the kids all by herself. And there's been times where I'll get up because we have a baby monitor in each of their rooms so I can we can both hear them and I'll, I'll get up and uh, l last time Mona was happy to see me. So I was able to support Penny cause she just had to go to Zoe's room. But both of these women run on so little sleep. I mean, Angie's often running on three hours of sleep weeks on end. And I look at her and I'm like, you're a marvel of human engineering. I don't even know how you do it. She coaches people half the day. She's smiling and laughing and gardening and, I'm like, you know, you're, you're, you should have been an army special forces ranger because you got the right equipment for that. And Penny is the same way. I, I honestly think women are some of the most amazing creations in the entire universe, but, uh, and, and, and thank God, um, uh, I managed to, uh, end up with two amazing women as my partners, but, um, uh, to switch gears a little, Kenny, what are, uh, some of the qualities that you feel that you needed to develop in order to be able to complete a race of this magnitude? Is there things from your own athletic career that you maybe had to work on developing such as discipline or the capacity to, to take pain or uh, things like that? Right. Um, you know, awareness, um, like Andrew said earlier, you've got to be aware of your surroundings, you know, otherwise you take your attention away from the road for a moment and it could be, you know, the last thing that happens. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and that little brain of yours. Um, clarity is, is, you know, another one is, you know, what is my objective here? What is my goal? And do I have a clear path to it or am I just bullshitting myself? Um, you know, that maybe that falls into having an identification of your dream goal or objective, as I hear you say. Um, and again, am I heading in the right direction? So, you know, those, those values, just again, having that clear perspective, um, and making your decisions, um, based on the priorities of your needs and goals. Yeah, I think that's important. Andrew, what are some of the qualities that you feel you had to work on developing in order to be able to complete the race across America or, or any of your real tough races uh, that you knew that, you know, like we all sort of know where our weakness is. You know, for example, I'm a lion type. I'm a sprinter. But when it comes to long, drawn out anything, I have a hard time staying the force. So for me, you know, I know if I'm going to do an event like that, I've got to really focus on my mental capacity to handle long, uh, drawn out um, events just because it's against my nature. So is there anything that you have 
had to work on to develop your ability to complete these very challenging athletic events? Uh, I think I have a skill with the endurance stuff. The funny thing is when I played soccer and believe it or not, I played football, basketball, um, et cetera. I was always the fastest. So I'm, I'm, I'm fast twitch as well. When I first started cycling, probably unlike Kenny, uh, I sucked. I mean, I sucked balls, man. I got my ass kicked for the first year and I don't know why I stuck with it. Maybe because it was so hard. Um, so what I think I did is I took my strength and, and, and power and speed and then added endurance to it to where now I can just continue. But I think the whole continuing aspect of, of it is mindset. I tell people, I'm not a born cyclist. I think I was a born athlete and I just turned my head into saying, Hey, I'm going to be a cyclist. Cause if I wanted to be, uh, I mean, like I grew up, I was going to be a soccer player, you know, and if, if that's what I decided I was going to do, then I was going to do it. Same thing when I decided that, uh, my wife, I wanted to marry her. It took a while, but I was like, you know, I got better endurance than she does. So I'm going to make sure that she tires out before I do. And, uh, I, I'll wear her down. But, uh, the hard part for me, I knew going into Ram, the hard part was going to be in this order, um, nutrition followed by sleep. Now sleep I can deal with. I deal well with little sleep because of being a dad, you know, and, and, uh, hours of, that, of work that were oftentimes in the morning training around those hours where I had to get up early to do, uh, swims and bikes and runs for the, for Ironman. Uh, but nutritionally, I was so diligent about what I put in my body. And the truth of the matter is when you're racing across America and every second counts, you can't just stop at a organic grocery store or, you know, cook some, some, uh, some steak or get some raw eggs or whatever the case may be, et cetera. Um, and I knew I was going to have to make some sacrifices. So my goal was to build my body up and make it resilient enough before the race across America so that I could handle the injustice of the sleep deprivation, the nutritional, uh, what, not detriments, but fallacies that you're going to do. Uh, and even the mental and emotional stress that goes along with uh, being cooped in a, uh, a confined environment with guys that were strangers at first that by the end of the race, hopefully become family because otherwise they're going to be your freaking sworn enemy. Cause, uh, uh, you know everything about him or her, but um, I think everything I did before Race Across America helped me handle the demands of the, the event. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that's probably the axis of development in any athletic uh, endeavor is the mind, because you. You know, it's the mind that you have to use to have the discipline. And I think with a lot of athletes, especially when they're younger, and I know both of you will probably agree with this, it takes more discipline to rest properly than it does to train yourself to death. I tell people all the time, Paul, I don't question your work ethic. I question your rest ethic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of, you know, we're all, we're, we're kind of have, especially young males, we have this fetish for the gas pedal, but it takes us a long time to learn to use the brake pedal. And this is where I, I talk to people. I say, you know, most people have plenty of willpower. I mean, like the kind of athletes that I work with and, and that you guys are, but it takes a lot of discipline to develop won't power. So willpower is the gas pedal, won't power is the brake, brake, right? So I say, you know, sometimes you need to say no to junk or you need to say no to staying up and watching a TV show when you really need to sleep and you know you need to sleep, but your part of you wants to be distracted or just be entertained for a while, but that doesn't play out well when you have to go do some hard training tomorrow and you're lagging. And you, if you get in the habit of making those excuses to yourself, then you end up being someone that still has a gas pedal but hasn't learned how to use the brakes. So the pain teacher comes to, to put the brakes on for you. Point being, I think a lot of, you know, in order to work with breathing, movement, nutrition, and hydration and sleep properly, you have to be able to use your mind effectively enough to 
get clear on what the meaning of making these sacrifices and changing changing your diet and lifestyle is, or you can just you know let your shadow talk you out of everything, and then you end up being somebody that wished they was a great athlete or you know like the old saying goes the older i get the faster i was meaning you never really accomplished much but now you sit in the bar and tell stories about what you did and 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 most people can't validate those stories (laughs) right well that's that's that uh that's the why power the why power has to complement your willpower because if there is no why power i don't care how strong your willpower is you won't do shit yeah now, something I'd like to discuss with both of you, which is a bit of a shift in our direction, but quite meaningful. In my career, I've seen a number of people that were quite healthy and had a clean diet get diseases, and some have died. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Two of my parents' friends, when I was a kid on the farm, Uh, Their name were Barbara and Steve. They were very, very deep into self-realization fellowship. They probably could have been uh, a monk and a nun. She could have been a nun. He could have been a monk. I mean, they were were school teachers. They had a super clean diet. I mean, they really lived Yogananda's principles. Last people in the world I would have ever expected to have gotten a disease and The husband, Steve, got brain cancer out of the blue, and within a year, he was dead. And a year later, his wife, Barbara, died of brain cancer. And so I remember being a kid looking at this going, why? I mean, how how does that happen? I mean, of course, I didn't have all the knowledge and training I do now, but but I've actually seen probably in my career probably 20 cases of people that when I analyze their diet, their lifestyle, yeah, it wasn't perfect. But it was better than 99% of the world population, and they got these serious diseases. So there's also the issue of children being born with or acquiring diseases early in life, like we talked about, Kenny, with your, your little guy, not your personal guy, but your, 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 the guy you're mentoring, um, which is um, unusual if the parents are even moderately healthy. So I'm curious as to your thoughts as to why you feel people get get or may get serious illnesses and diseases that seem out of character for their life regarding the life that they're living and what can we learn from the disease process that makes us better stronger wiser people and possibly teachers for many others in the world so there's two questions in there why do you think it is that healthy people who by all intensive means shouldn't be getting diseases get them and what do you think that the disease ultimately may be giving us as a gift to carry into our own experience of life in the world. So uh, you want to start first, Kenny? Uh, my, my first uh, instinct there is inherited family trauma. Yes, that's a real issue. Yes. Um, I think you had Mark Wolin on a while back. And yes. What do you call it? Unconscious uh, loyalty, maybe or something like that. Yeah. Um, I I feel like I've experienced a little bit of that with not necessarily a physical disease, but just repeating history with some of the, some of the we'll say the inner saboteur stuff that I've that I've had happen. Uh, I know happened to my grandfather and happened to my father, and then happened to me all about the same time, in in one's in one's life, and um, I think that's just one of those things that most people it's not on anyone's radar unless it's on your radar. Um, and it's, it seems like a very real, uh, phenomenon, if you will be beyond that. I would say being for people to open their minds, be, get clear on their dream dreams, goals, and objectives. Cause I, I imagine sometimes when that happens, perhaps if we had those things on the straight and narrow to begin with, perhaps then we'd be living our dream we would somehow pull free of the gravity of that, you know, that, that ectoplasm or whatever you want to call it. That's, that's in that field. Um, I I don't know. You would probably know better than, than, than I for sure there, but I'd say that's one of the biggest things to learn is, is, you know, these things can affect us, you know, um, 
generations later. Current research shows up to 14 generations they're able to now validate through scientific research. Um, when Mark Wu Lin wrote his book, there was good support for three generations, which he oriented his teachings on. He was aware of multiple generations, but since that book came out, there's been a number of other studies showing quite conclusively that we're most susceptible to 14 generations of wow. our ancestors' genetic influences and in and, and native cultures and in, in the Chinese culture where they worship their ancestors, they're already very aware that there's, there's you know, the ancestors aren't dead. They're, shall we say, in the spirit realm and they're still working through us for better or worse. So mm -hmm. I think that's a, a, a very real and, you know, I could say all sorts of stuff about it, but I don't want to get too sidetracked. Uh, I, I was just curious what you guys thought. Andrew, do you have comments on why you think people that are too healthy to get serious diseases end up with them? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm the spitting image of that, Paul. I mean, I, you know, I was studying underneath you for um, somewhere around, I mean, three or four years, which is nothing in the big scheme of things, perhaps. But I mean, I was already healthy. And I can remember when I was diagnosed, I mean, at the age of 32, people were like, if, if, if you can get cancer, shit, then there's no hope for the rest of us. You do everything perfectly, which wasn't exactly the case. But what I think it is, I agree with, with Kenny and the idea that there's definitely uh, inherited, you know, family trauma, uh, et cetera, which can be healed. I've seen it healed, actually. Um, but I, I think we're so much more than the physical. So it's, it's, it's it, I, I think oftentimes if you don't know of a true etiology, like when I went to the uh, oncologist's office the first time and then they're like, walked in there like that look there's nothing that you did to start this there's nothing you could have done to prevent it it just is what it is which basically means they don't know shit like they 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 didn't know science doesn't know and because science can't measure it. what they can they can't measure they can't measure um uh, ancestral trauma they can't measure thoughts uh i mean I can't for remember, me can't i was always your fears your emotions yeah. your dreams your fantasies really most yeah. of who you are <laughs> it, it, exactly and so if they can't measure it it's not real to them and and uh i mean i was always very good at handling physical uh what trauma and stress but the emotional stress i think was something that mo most of us don't realize how truly powerful that is it, I, for me it's the driver and i think for most people it's probably the the driver um and then i also think you told me once that, you know, maybe one of the roles of you being here with leukemia is to teach people how to live with the disease. And I think that's true. And I also think it may be my role one day, hopefully later rather than sooner to show people how to die, you know, well, if you know what I mean. So Osher says, I think it's Osher that's, you know, souls come into our life sometimes just to change the direction of another soul and people see me and hear me you know interact with me and maybe whatever it is they're getting from me is enough to change their direction and to make it uh make them be on a better path and so i, I consider with everything i'm going through all the shitty stuff at times to be a gift not only to myself, but hopefully to everybody else that's in my sphere of influence. And, you know, I try not to question why, because maybe it's not in my lifetime to know the why. And maybe with distance or time, I will be given that perspective. But I think, I think there's something good to come from, from leukemia. I was looking for a book. I think it's a book both of you would find fascinating. I've referred it to it in some of my teachings at the Institute and on podcasts. And I was just trying to remember the title. It's by Margaret A. Newman. And I think it's called Health as Expanding Consciousness. Okay. But that book really was a powerful book for me. She was a very unusual nurse who really did a lot to try to reform the hospital system to, to make it really more of a health care system and less of a disease maintenance system. But unfortunately she didn't get 
much uh, traction, um, sadly, as is the case when wise people go into the public and seem completely outside the box and people should be listening to them, but they don't. But one of the things that she really points out is that challenge the challenges that diseases bring us bring us deeper into a spiritual connection with ourself and they give us the reason to look deeper in beneath the surface of our appearance or our just superficial ego self to see what it is inside of us that's not being nourished or or what is what is a need that's been met and then, of course, you have carryover from past lives, and I've studied that and, and done a lot of work in that area, and, and also I do past life regressions with clients and have found all sorts of really profound stuff that once it was cleared, their, their whatever was ailing them completely cleared up, or it was one of the things that they had going on that cleared up, and there was no question about it. But I think having been a therapist for many such cases, I think that particularly with children, that they often come into families and consciously, not consciously maybe, but consciously when they were in their afterlife made an agreement to take on a disease process as a sacrifice of love because I've seen families that were very broken and, and just at each other's throat all the time and really unhealthy. Then all of a sudden, a child gets cancer or somebody in the family gets cancer. And for the first time, when they face the real possibility of one of their family members dying, they really it brought the love out of them that wasn't there when the person didn't have the problem. So I've seen in a number of cases how someone in the family may consciously or unconsciously sacrifice themselves to a disease to give the family something bigger than themselves to learn how to love for and how to be a family again. So I think also that advanced souls, you know, just like great athletes need bigger and bigger challenges, right? You guys didn't just uh, wake up one day and decide you were going to jump into the race across America without even being able to do a, a, a local, you know, 50 mile or whatever. Um, but I think as, spiritual athletes will call them evolve they come into the earth plane specifically to go through challenges that will put them in a situation where all their life experience and even past life experience uh is put into a circumstance that gives them the opportunity for legitimate growth at their level of development spiritually and i, I know i've seen uh, a number of children in my career with very serious diseases, some of them right on the edge of death, but their attitude was just unbelievable, you know, and, and some of them even have no fear of dying. I've seen that on a, a variety of cases and it's just astounding to watch. And it's as though you're looking at a child that's got the wisdom of tick, not Han or somebody like that, you know? Yeah. So I, I think that some of us acquire diseases because part of us knows that we'll be too distracted by the buzz of the world and get caught in the world and not do our growth work while we're here. And having a disease really just puts you right on the hot seat. It's either do the growth work or die, or do the growth work so that if you do die, you can die peacefully or die well. I think I think you guys would both agree that if you don't live well, you're probably not going to die well. Right, right, right. Because living well really requires that we face our fears. I mean, think of what it takes for you guys to do these races or, you know, doing a criterion race where guys are getting wiped out with mass bicycle wipeouts. And you know, anybody that's watched the Tour de France have seen, you know, people have serious injuries in there I, I when i was a fighter just in the 12 years that i was a competitive fighter I, I i know of at least three if not four guys that died in the boxing ring uh, in fact one of my best friends almost died in the boxing ring so we we 
if we don't learn, if we don't go into athletic endeavors or some kind of challenge where we get pitted up against our fears and we don't learn how to deal with fear and, and convert that into positive uh, life affirmative energy. I know I've had to deal with all sorts of shit in my life and I, I either had a choice, let it disable me or figure out how to center myself, ground myself and say, well, what can I do now? You know, yeah. oftentimes the situation's so overwhelming, you're paralyzed, but if you just say, well, what can I do now? It's like Lao Tzu says, a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So I think a lot of times that we, as human beings, or as souls, as immortal souls, come into mortal experiences where we have a time window with which that the lesson can be gained so that we can ultimately learn the lesson, which is really a step in the greater realization of who we are and what we really are, because all these things really grow us. Hi, you guys. I know you all know that super green powders are good for you if they're made from organic sources and they're processed properly. So the nutrients are there. And that's exactly what Paleo Valley does with their super greens powder. So I brought Autumn Smith in to tell us exactly how she created it and why and what it's going to do for you when you try their amazing organic super greens powder. Autumn, what is the magic you've got here? Well, like you said, we all need to get more of those micronutrients that you find in fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we've created a powder that you do not have to choke down. It has an absolutely delicious berry lemonade flavor. And the reason that it's different is because A, it is all organic, 23 organic superfood ingredients. And B, it is a very, very gut-friendly product because what I found in my practice is that a lot of people don't do well with cereal grasses. And we know cereal grasses, like wheatgrass, can contain lectins that can be hard on the guts of a lot of people I work with. And so what we did was we created a a cereal grass-free alternative. We use high quality, the cleanest, highest quality spirulina on the market raised in India. And then we added the 22 other organic fresh fruits and vegetables and the flavor will surprise you. So all you have to do to check it out is go ahead to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase c-h-e-k-15, at checkout. My son drinks it every day. We call it his ninja juice, and I sincerely hope your family loves it as much as ours does. All right, everybody, go paleo green and get rocking. Hope you love it. We've kind of covered the six foundation principles. I think my next question for both of you is from my experience looking into issues of fundraising for cancer research and diseases in general, almost all the money that gets raised goes into allopathic drug-based and surgical-based research. So, um, you know, I know that that must have crossed your mind, the two of you holistic dudes. Um, and I know from our discussions that some of the guys on the RAM te team uh, took the allopathic approach and you guys were more aligned with the holistic approach. approach. So I'm wondering, what are your feelings about this dichotomy of, of sacrificing so much to do a race that's ultimately raising money for, uh, you know, an allopathic medical model, which I think we all would agree probably harms and kills more people than it helps. How did you guys process that, assess that reality inside of yourself? Well, if I can speak to that, Paul, just because I think I've I've seen kind of both sides of it, meaning I've benefited from um, part, at least, of an all allopathic approach, and then been able to survive the 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 downside of the allopathic approach because of how I treated my body holistically, um, and, and I would say that the the biggest thing that we were able to do with raising money for a cause pediatric cancer in this case is we were able to to raise hope more than a, more than more than money we raised hope and hope is where healing begins that's that's where it starts and 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 with hope that gives you enough time and enough drive and enough of the why power to stick around until 
either the, the conventional approach becomes uh, more aligned with holistic principles or you find holistic principles that can then serve you, you know, serve your thoughts, your breath, your hydration, nutrition, movement, sleep, so that you can finally do what the body wants to do, which is just heal. But I think it all begins with hope. Um, and like, even in my own practice, there was a time where to work with me, you had to do a nutrition and lifestyle consult because I'm like, what good is being on the best exercise program in the world until we get your biochemistry right? Um, and, and the answer is it, it's not going to do you any good. But I realized, again, with the help of my incredibly intelligent wife, that you got to make meet people where they are. And while you might be able to get people to, to wake up at five o'clock in the morning and do a set of squats to get them to put down their freaking Pop-Tart and Twinkie and coffee, is that those are fighting words, right? So meet them where they are, gain their trust with the physical, you know, or in this case, the allopathic approach. And then as you earn that trust and they start to believe more of what you're practicing, what, what you're demonstrating, what you're living, then they think, okay, well, wow, he's eating this way, thinking with this way, breathing. And then they're w willing to take on more of those nutrition and lifestyle components. And then again, truly, I think when you get truly deep, 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 and they, you've earned their trust enough, then you can start talking about the spiritual aspect of, of why they're either here or why they're sick or why they're not happy and what we can do to, to change that because ultimately that's the hardest part to, to convince people of is the spiritual aspect of it. And yet I also think, again, it's the driver, you know, it's, it's without spirit, you're dead, right? Yeah. Yep. Kenny, what's your thoughts in that regard? And just so you, you guys know, I, I don't have any judgment of it. Um, I, I just have concerns having been in this industry for 37 years and spent my whole career dealing largely with people that failed in the medical system and also knowing the power of holistic approaches. But, I you know, I don't put money in the 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 red basket when the American Heart Association's at the shopping mall begging for money to do cancer research. I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is a joke. It, you know, all I got to do is do 10 minutes of research and I can see you guys got more damn money than you can spend. So it's kind of like a twisted thing. But because it's the race across America, you know, the, 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 the feeling I get in my gut is like when I saw McDonald's becoming a sponsor of the Olympics, I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I mean, right. talk about selling out, talk about right. washing out the whole concept of athletic development. So it's really more of a discussion of how, how did it sit with you and, and what's the story you tell yourself inside in order to say it's okay. So Kenny, how do you handle it? Uh, well, you know, from a perspective, it's, it goes back to education, education of our children. And, and people today just aren't, it's like they're lost and unaware. Maybe they're in a trance that they don't get that they can take care of themselves, you know, the I, and they, I had, I recently had to have a, a medical procedure and, and when I put on there that I'd take no prescription meds, et cetera. And I went through the little questionnaire, like, and they said record time, they were like, well, you're really lucky. I was like, luck had nothing to do with it. Yes, it's like right. my tail off to, you know, avoid those things as opposed to wearing it like a badge of honor. Um, I've seen plenty of family members who start telling me, oh, I'm taking this and this and this. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. You know, as if it's, a, like I said, an honor. Um, so, you know, if we could educate our children and understanding that, you know, what good healthy food is, you know, uh, avoiding GMOs, avoiding uh, toxicity in the, in the soil and in the water and the air and you mean taking Bill the Gates? responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Bill Gates at all costs. Yeah, yeah there you go. Um, it, 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 so, you know, understanding that there is that holistic approach, it's like a, you know, it's a two-sided coin. And at the same time, yes, sometimes Andrew is a good example. An allopathic approach is necessary. He did everything he could and he's now, you know, on a medication that's keeping him alive. 
And so it's, it's, it's not all bad. It's just that when we trade this for that is when it's not so, you know, good. Um, so that's, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. And, and just to sort of show, just to highlight how true that is in my own life, Angie Check, who you both know is one of the healthiest human beings I've ever met in my life and always has been. I mean, she's 46, I think, but her body looks and feels like an 18 year old, maybe 20 if I stretch it. But in both cases, we did everything to get her ready to give birth to, to Mana the right exercise, the best food, biogeometry, living close to the earth, everything I teach, she's a master of. But lo and behold, at the last minute, there's an emergency. Mana's heart rate's dropping down to half what it should be when she's just sitting there doing a routine checkup. The next thing you know, we're having to have a C-section. So the next time when she got pregnant with Zoe, we were like, okay, we got to even be more diligent. And we had the doula, we had the midwife, she did regular meetings with midwife. I mean, we did everything you can possibly do, but this time Zoe's turned around backwards. So her face is up against Angie's sacrum and her head's cocked, which we didn't know till after 37 hours of extremely painful labor. I mean, I've never seen a human being take so much pain in my life and she is tough as nails. And I'm like, any minute she's going to go unconscious from the pain. And she was just got to the point where she was so exhausted, she couldn't even push anymore. So then our doctor, Nathan Riley, who I've had on the podcast a couple of times and is a fantastic OBGYN and surgeon, says, well, why don't we try an epidural and just let her try to sleep for a while and see if the because he said the uterus will keep pushing on its own, even if she's sleeping. And maybe she'll dilate some more. She was like seven or eight centimeters dilated. So um, so we did that. And eight, 10, 12 hours later, there's no change. And she's still in a lot of pain and still exhausted. So we had to make the executive decision for the second time to have a C-section. So, you know, it, it just I'm bringing the point up that I've learned, too, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, and I've had some bad injuries. I mean, I, I've had internal bleeding racing motorcycles. I've fractured my left leg in five places, and my leg was just crushed and shattered from a cliff diving accident. Um, you know, there's many times that I ended up in the hospital and didn't even know how I got there and had to be, you know, sewn back together or <laughs> plated or screwed or whatever I needed. And so I think that it's not necessarily that the allopathic system's bad. It's just when it gets abused by people whose intention is making money, not helping people heal. And when we have billions and billions and billions, if not trillions of dollars that have been invested in educating people into medicating every at, uh, itch, scratch, and bump because it's profitable to a few corporations and not putting any money into educating people on how to live a healthy lifestyle. In fact, I don't know if you guys remember when C. Everett Koop was the Surgeon General of the United States. I think that was the Reagan era, maybe. I can't remember. Yeah, Reagan. Yeah. Yeah. Reagan, yeah. But I'll never forget. I, I don't watch TV much, but I just happened to be sitting on the couch watching a show. And then all of a sudden, this Surgeon General's announcement came on. It was the big, you know, like a presidential announcement. And he said, do you realize that of the top 10 killers of Americans, nine out of 10 of them are lifestyle diseases and that people could save themselves from unnecessary illness and, and death by simply improving the quality of the food they eat and their lifestyle. Next day, headline news. He's out of there. He got fired for saying that. Yeah. Holy shit. You know, and I'm like, that's what happens when you don't have a government. You have a corporate headquarters. So I think really, if there's part of the mission that people like us have in the world, 
It's to say allopathy is a tool in the toolbox, just like homeopathy is a tool in the toolbox and breathing and cold plunges and Tai Chi and Qi Gong and meditation and uh, singing and dancing and drumming and rattling and shamanic approaches. And I think it's really just a matter of remembering the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. What can I do for myself to bring myself back into harmony instead of waiting for 10 or 12 years to start feeling so bad I go for a medical checkup and all of a sudden I got told I got six months to live because I got a tumor the size of a grapefruit growing in my chest or my lungs or something like that. And I've seen that happen many times in my career where people thought everything was fine. And the next thing you know, they go for a routine checkup and they've got a very, very serious disease. And I've, in fact, identified some of them that slipped through the hands of doctors and were very, very serious and life-threatening diseases. So I think, I think in closing, we would probably all agree that it's really about first do no harm, but you have to be responsible for the one that implements enough of a holistic lifestyle approach into your daily life to be prophylactic medicine or preventative medicine. I mean, wearing a condom after your girlfriend's pregnant doesn't help much. And deciding to eat healthy food when you're dying of cancer is a bit late. It'll help, but it's a bit late. Yeah. So I think we all need to <clears throat> we need we need to become conscious of the fact there's another layer of this. And the other layer of this is that if we aren't conscious of the fact that spending all this money on drugs and junk food is contributing to the destruction of the planet then we actually don't realize that being a holistically oriented person is synonymous with being earth conscious and nature conscious and knowing that the power of the money we spend is either going into the hands of companies and people that are really caring for the planet and growing things organically and producing high quality natural medicines versus using fossil fuels to manufacture drugs and synthetics to manufacture drugs and creating the illusion that that's a good thing when in reality all that money if spent on healthy practices and sustainable practices would have altered the environment to make it so much healthier that far less allopathic drugs and surgeries would have ever been needed in the first place right so the real disease we have is that we make money more important than life itself. And, and, you know, you can't buy love and you can't eat money. And I think if we're not careful, we're going to have to face those two realities in a very, very, uh, harsh way because we're just pushing the whole system to the edge of its ability. Yeah. I, I and I think that's obviously happening. And unfortunately, I, part of me thinks it's, it's it's going to happen, and yet maybe it's what's necessary because if you hit rock bottom, at least you know which way. You only got one way to go, right? Yeah. Um, but we just may need to hit rock bottom, um, and I'm it's it's coming a lot quicker than than most of us realize. Well, and part of the thing that concerns me with all this stuff that's going on in the world right now, with all these mandates and you know vaccine passports and all this shit is if you really look at the Great Reset, what it's all about, it's it's the same guys that own the same corporations that have been destroying nature and selling us fossil fuels and suppressing advanced technologies and energy medicine technologies and all this other crap. And their whole thing is you're going to own nothing and love it or be happy. But the reality of it is all they're doing is forcing us into a deeper materialistic consumer model Difference is you have to buy everything from them, which goes right back to Rockefeller. When Rockefeller used to own mines, he wouldn't pay people with money. He paid them with credit slips that they could use, but they could only buy things in the stores that he owned. So this is the same mindset, same people up to the same shit. So if we don't realize that we've got to get together right now and stand up for our freedom and go through the sacrifices of not using social media platforms that are addictive and they're part of the game 
and only using our phone as tools, not as a form of escaping life and getting caught up in games and spending enough time in the reality of what the earth needs from us and what we need from each other instead of doing things like I'm in airports and restaurants and I see people's husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend sitting side by side, not talking, but texting each other. I mean, that, that's not how you live. That means you have a serious addiction. You've, you are living in a reality that does not interface with the earth. So I think part of the transition we need to make, and I, I, I recently had a very potent podcast with Jamie Wheel, which may be out by the Transhumanism. time. Transhumanism, yeah. Yeah, which by the time this one's out, that was James Tunney, but Jamie Wheel wrote the book uh, Stealing Fire and Recapture the Rapture. Very, very potent. But um, what, what I said in my podcast with Jamie, I think the greatest thing in the world right now would be if something happened that shut the power off worldwide for about two weeks, because then they wouldn't have access to all their brainwashing technology that's being used against them. They would have to reconnect to each other. They would have to find food. They would have to find water. And they would realize how absolutely sacred life is and that if you don't have a relationship with the earth, you will die in the absence of electricity. So, you know, Joseph Campbell says, if you want to find out who your God is, just ask yourself what you can't do without for two or three days. Well, we can't do without food for too long. We can do without it for three days. We can't do without water for too long. Um, we need each other but we can't do without the world for even a minute. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I'm using this opportunity to say the allopathic approach, if not counterbalanced by the holistic approach brings us to where we're at right now, because everything that's happening right now is a complete and utter disrespect to the Hippocratic oath. First, do no harm. And to buy into that is to turn the world into a shopping mall controlled by a very few people for their own good and will lead us into a crisis of physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual disruption that has never been even imagined except for people in one of Hitler's concentration camps. Right. In closing, uh, not to close out on a, on, a, on a sour sounding note, I think it's a great opportunity for us all to kind of get ready for our own race across America. But it's really, you know, we've all got to get ready to really start being more loving, respectful and supportive of each other because we've all got work to do. We've all got sacrifices to make. And one of the things I loved about talking to you guys about doing such a really seriously hard event was to find out what do you have to do physically, emotionally, and mentally, and spiritually to prepare for an event like that and to really do it well and to continue to keep doing it. And how do those issues relate to what any one of us can do? So I think we were, we were very successful at, at sharing that. Are there any closing comments that either of you would like to share uh, before we say goodbye? Uh, well, Paul, I mean, to going back to the why power, you know, the, the couples with your willpower, for me, especially now that I have a son, but even before then, just to influence the other people in my life, I, I'd love for people to understand that that health is actually possible, you know? So I remember when uh, my friends from Spain came over to visit, um, like in, in, in right year 2000, so 21 years ago at this point. And they got off the airplane and they said, the first thing they said, and they're nice people, but they're like, my God, everybody here in America is fat because <laughs> nobody in Spain at the time was fat. So, but we get so used to it. And I think we've gotten so used to everybody being on a prescription drug, everybody being overweight, everybody being overworked, uh, undernourished, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera that we don't recognize what health is. And it's like, like, you know, the, the shaman story about, the shamans were the only ones who could see the big ships coming over from the new world or from the old world to the new world because they had seen them in their dreams. But 
it was so outside of the the realm of possibility for most everybody else that they couldn't see the sh that, that they couldn't see the ships and now i think we've gotten to the point where health has gotten so outside of the reality for most people that they don't they can't even comprehend it now they can't even see it and so when they see somebody like paul check you know 60 years old lifting weights out sprinting 20 year olds they just they think it's smoke and mirrors or something crazy and I think the more people that we get to start practicing what the Czech Institute teaches with the six foundational factors of health and starting to recognize their true potential, then we're going to wake more people up. So we collapse that wave function and they start seeing, you know, particles and waves. They start seeing health as opposed to the only thing they could see, which was disease. I mean, wouldn't that be freaking cool? Like, I mean, wouldn't that be great if instead of being scared of a freaking virus, maybe you had more confidence in your your body being able to withstand a, a virus, whether it's uh, imaginary or not? You know, yeah. I mean, let's focus on what we want and energize that instead. And and I think Kenny and I through the race across America just shows what's possible. You know. Yes, indeed, Kenny. Uh closing comments in that regard from you yeah I would, you know i'd say you know for people to you know like andrew i think just said focus on what you want not what you don't want and one of the things lately uh during my my meditations was it, it came to me that I, I don't want to say nothing is sacred anymore but i thought about the the concept of just keeping everything sacred and i think I think that's in the uh, the Cherokee uh, Nation that, that represents, um, you know, living a life sacred and or in a sacred manner, and having, you know, the wisdom to understand um, what's important in life and to kind of fulfill your your place in society or the world and and how you might serve others, but. Uh, yeah, it's just if you keep everything sacred, then you're gonna you're gonna have a more of an open heart. You're gonna have empathy, perhaps not sympathy for others, and um, you know, just I think we're we're too caught up in our in our egos and our minds these days, and you know, we're in a trance. We're on our phones, like you were saying, and that you know that lowers our vibration. It does. If we can get away from if we can get away from those things, and and like I said, keep keep things sacred, have an open heart, then your vibration is gonna you're gonna raise, and you're gonna you're gonna prevent disease from creeping in as easily. And then if it does, then you've got a better shot at getting it back out again. Exactly. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, something I wanted to share with both of you that's kind of funny because you were talking about. Andrew, how and both of you really how people have forgotten what health is, and and if they see a guy like me out running and outlifting young guys, they think it's some kind of a gimmick. Well, Penny forwarded me a comment somebody left on uh, I think it was the Czech Institute Facebook page, accusing me of airbrushing my abdominals and saying, <laughs> you know, you you have enough credibility that you don't need to to do tricks like that. And I and we were all the whole staff, of course, was just cracking up laughing. And I, I didn't know this, but they said that was the third time that they've had people say that on the Czech Institute's Facebook page that that I'm airbrushing my photos to make me look like that. <laughs> That's hilarious. So I said to Penny, what did you do? And I, she said, well, I'm doing it right now. And so she took several pictures from of me at, from different, you know, events or things that she had in her database showing that you know i have definitely got real abdominals and she was sending them to this guy to say hey oh by the way this is what paul actually looks like every day <laughs> right 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 so it was That's just cool. funny i i saw that and i just cracked up laughing you know i'm like oh my god somebody actually thinks that I, of me that's really i couldn't even imagine that but there it is <laughs> You got to get him into the Institute soon and get him studying some stuff. Yeah. 
yeah, well, it'd probably be easier for him to just Photoshop himself. I mean, that's one of the diseases that I didn't realize till I did some research into why there's so much depression and anxiety and suicide amongst the young people using all these social media forums. And it's one of the reasons they tracked it back to is they're using so much Photoshopping that when they're sharing pictures with people that are their so-called friends, and then one day are going to meet them, they're dead shocked and scared to death at what's going to happen when they see what they really look like because they keep putting all these fake pictures of themselves on the internet and come to realize later that, oh my God, they're actually going to expect me to look like this. And so they go into a crisis of self and then they don't want to meet anybody. So they just have to further isolate themselves, which is very, very sad. Well, guys, it's been a fantastic conversation and I'm really proud of both of you guys. You know, both of you have got uh, a lot to be proud of yourselves for, for your athletic development and the challenge that you face, the development that you've uh, given yourself and committed yourself to, and, and even uh, your commitment to your studies and growth through the Czech Institute. And Andrew, you're one of the few master check practitioners in the world. I don't know, there might be 15 or 20 of them out there out of almost 20 to 25,000 people that are at some stage of their development in the training. So to, to do that work is a real commitment to mastery. So thank you for leading by example. And for all of you listening, I hope that the conversation with two of the best athletes in the world right here has been inspiring for you and helped you realize that we all have challenges to work through. And, and sometimes it's not our own disease, but it's someone we love or uh, it's something unexpected or uh, any kind of crisis, but that we can use the principles and the concepts that Andrew and Kenny shared with us to be a better participant, a more loving, more present and more committed participant in life itself and I think right now, based on everything we all know and that we've discussed here, it's the time to really step the game up a little bit and really get deeper into yourself and get more whole and more resource so we can all actually contribute to the changes we need to make in the world. If nothing else, out of complete love and respect for Mother Nature, because God knows we've got her down on her knees begging for help, which means we're on our knees begging for help. So thank you again to all the sponsors. I love you. You all make beautiful, sustainable, truly healthy products. And all the money we spend on your products is supporting the planet. Thanks all of you to buying anything from the sponsors. It gets a little commission to the podcast to help me keep the podcast going. And I'd like to close by saying we are safe. We are home. We are whole. A whole great spirit. See you guys again with something very exciting. Lots of love. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guests, Andrew Johnson and Kenny Baker. You can follow Andrew on Facebook at andrew.johnston.754 and Instagram at andrewjohnston.triumphtraining or visit his website, triumphtraining.com, to find out more about his services or to purchase a triathlon training plan. Pick up one of Andrew's books, Holistic Training for Triathlon, Spot on Nutrition or Holistic Respiration at triumphtraining.com or at amazon.com. You can find Kenny on Instagram at zen underscore surfer or visit his website 51fitness.org to find out more about his consultations. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at Paul Check, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to check videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chickiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.